with that. Maureen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you tonight. And um, I actually was working in Tacoma when Safe Streets was founded. And I remember the day that the gangs came in. So yeah, so um, good for you for all the work that you've done all these years and expanding beyond those first really scary streets. So um, legislative advocacy is just part of the advocacy world and to, but before we do anything, well, it actually, I think you probably know it has, the evening has a name, thanks to John Lewis. I mean, you know, gotta make good trouble, necessary trouble. And I really believe that we have to do that if we wanna see the kind of social change that we are about. Um, so to help me, um, how many people are first time advocates at the state level? If you can raise, oh, look at that. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I don't know about the rest. I know if I opened up something, maybe I could see it. But okay, so we at least have some. How many people have at least five years experience? Anybody? Just maybe just say mm -hmm. if you do. Okay. Karen. All right. How about 10 years experience? Between five and 10. Between five and 10. Okay. More than 10. Here's Mike. I have more than 10. Mike, do you have a last name? Curly. Excellent. Thank you. Um, anybody more than 20? Okay. All right. So for some of you, this is going to be old hat and you can chime in in the chat or given the, what are we about 13? Um, we might be able just to do this as, as, a, um, as a conversation among us. We'll give it a shot. But the first thing is, and uh, Roxanne, if you wanna bring up, it's actually page five. If you can bring up page five. So just keep, yeah. Okay, I don't know, can you get rid of all of the stuff around? That's all right. Okay, first things first. Ah, perfect, thank you. All right, if you don't have this phone number in your phone, put it in right now except the person who's on the phone. 1-800-562-6000. That's the legislative hotline for the state of Washington. 1-800-562-6000. You can reach anybody in the legislature through that number. Eventually, you'll have your own legislators office numbers in there, but start with this. There's a wonderful, um, a uh, woman who taught at uh, UW Seattle for years and who came to the Northwest in the 80s out of Washington, DC, where some of us already knew her by virtue of her work and her publications, Nancy Amade. And she's just a first rate community organizer and taught, I don't know how many people she taught to be good advocates. And I, a number of years ago, I was uh, working for Habitat for Humanity of Washington State and I had Nancy come and talk to the Habitat folks and at that time, that was kind of like, we were still in flip phones. Or, and so Nancy comes in and she comes in with a cutout, a paper cutout of a flip phone and she hands it up. It's a huge one. And she said, this is the most important thing you're gonna learn today. Put this number in your phone. <laughs> and I don't remember what she talked about the rest of the time, but I remember Nancy standing there with that paper cutout, giving us the phone number to put in. You can do the same with members of Congress. Um, I've got mine in, I, I have, you know, coffee with Congress in the morning, because we've got that nice time difference. Um, and you can put in your uh, local elected officials, your um, state folks, whomever is your normal kind of contact area, but for these purposes, the state. So the legislative hotline, the other thing is the legislative website, and we're going to look at that in a few minutes. 
those are two really good, um, excellent resources that the state of Washington provides. You don't have to learn this stuff from scratch. Um, a lot of work has gone into making it easier for normal human beings to actually be able to understand what the legislature is doing and to follow what they're doing. So if you wanna bring us the next slide, please. Make new friends. Now, um, I'm probably the only new friend I'm gonna guess, but um, there are so few of us. Let's just take a few minutes. Your name and just one thing about you. Not a paragraph, like a phrase. So I'm Maureen Howard, and I've been doing this work since 1982. And just go next. This is Mike. I can go next. OK. My name is Mike Curley. I've been doing this since about 1989, 90. All right. There. Somebody else. I'm Eric Hasted, and I've been a community mobilizer with Safe Streets for coming up on three years. And maybe, Roxanne, if you could um, stop sharing your screen so we could see more people while we just do the sharing. Good. Thank you. OK, next. My name is Connor Schultz. I've been a mobilizer for almost a year. I think it'll be a year at the sometime middle of next month. All right. I'm Donna Thompson. I'm a, I'm a board member for Safe Streets and just a community member and love supporting this organization. Excellent. There are no just community members, trust me. My name is Caitlin Oler. I use she, her pronouns, and I have advocated once at the county level, and that's all. All right. So I'm very excited to learn. All right. Okay, next. My name is uh, Wanda Rochelle and I'm with Safe Streets and I've been involved in Legislative Advocacy Day every year with youth down in Olympia and helping train the youth to, to speak to the legislature. So excellent. I've got a little bit of experience under my belt. All right. Next. I'm Alberto Rodriguez. I'm also a community mobilizer with Safe Streets and I'm very excited to learn and pass this knowledge along. All right. Next person. I am Darren Pan, a face sheet mobilizer for 26 years, just a mobilizer and been involved in an Alvin Olympia over 10 years. All right. Asian Pacific Cultural Center. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, next. Heidi? Thanks, uh, sorry, it takes me a second to unmute. I have agitated and contacted my representative for decades, but just on individual things as they come up. So I'm really looking forward to getting more uh, well-organized and doing it on a more consistent basis. Excellent. Um, Jay Artis? Uh oh, Jaron. Jaron? Yeah, hello. Um, you know. Think. Can you repeat the question for me? It was it was a little loud in here, so I just I didn't fully hear it. Uh, how long have you been? Um, just one thing about yourself. Oh, just one thing about myself. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, just in general, I I just love I love sports. So, like you love it's, sports? It's, yeah, it's a big okay. deal for me. Like sports okay. in my household is is king. So, queen. Okay. You have to play a little bit here. Um, who else have we got? We've got Roxanne. So my name is Roxanne Simon. I am a community mobilizer. I've been with Safe Streets for just over three years. And I haven't, I've only advocated in Olympia when I was at Pierce College, but I advocate for survivors of domestic violence and also with the Homeless Coalition and on the Key Peninsula, um, Derek Young knows me very well. So Good. I do my own in advocating. Excellent. Advocacy. Excellent. Did we miss anybody? Okay. 
So um, if you're so inclined, uh, one of the things somebody else taught me is to use the chat to rename yourself and if, you know, whatever, your organization or preferred pronouns or pretty much anything. So feel free to do that as well. Um, it's always a little awkward when we can see some of our each other, but not everybody. So we'll just muddle through. So um, Roxanne, if you want to bring up, uh, must be slide seven. It says show up on it. Okay, we, we did that one. Let's just go to the next one. I got it. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is, and then you can bring it down. Um, go ahead and take it, either make it smaller or take it away, one or the other. Okay, so, so here's the thing. After you got the phone number in your phone so that you've got immediate access, you gotta show up. I mean, it's that simple. If you're not there, somebody else is gonna make the decisions about you, for you. And so that becomes then, how do, how do you show up? Well, the beauty of doing this now, as opposed to doing this in the early 80s, is that you can show up virtually. And we're going to have to show up virtually in a real concentrated and disciplined manner when the legislature starts January 11th, because there will be no access for members of the public. Right now, the plan is that the legislators, some of them will be there in person part of the time, but this will be a virtual session and the legislative buildings will not be open to the general public. That doesn't mean we can't show up. So what you have to get good at between now and then is knowing all the ways to show up. And I'm gonna guess just looking at a few of you, or you're probably a lot better at this than I am. Um, but if you're not comfortable with using some form of social media with writing an email that doesn't have glaring um, things jumping around in it or something like that, legislators read a ton of information and their staff read a ton of information. And so this is not when you want things um, singing and dancing and jumping and you know those kinds of logos and things. This is when you wanna be able to make your point and we'll talk about that a little more. But the, most, the important thing is that you gotta be able to show up and you've got, there are times you wanna show up alone and there are times you wanna show up with others. Like you were talking about the advocacy day, I think Rochelle was talking, or Wanda was talking about that um, earlier. So, um, so advocacy days are all going to be virtual. And so that's going to be a challenge for the organizers, but they'll figure it out. I have confidence in that. And now, uh, Roxanne, if you want to bring up the next slide and it's got like 85 tiny lines on it. It's just a copy and paste of the um, actual uh, legislative information center. Oh, look at that. It doesn't look as bad as I thought it was going to look. All right. So I reorganized a little bit of this. Um, and I think if try clicking on something and let's see if it's live. No, nah, that's all right. Okay. It'll be live when you bring it up. It's ledge.wa.gov. And if you Google Washington State Legislature, you're going to get it. And It'll be on the menu on the left of the main legislative page. And then when you bring it up, this is pretty much what it's gonna look like. So it becomes the one page that you wanna flag so you can easily find it because there's way more on here by way of information than you're probably gonna use. But if you have never actually gone through the legislative process or tracked a bill, or even used the legislative website, there are these online tutorials right in the middle of the page there. And they are good. And it, it can be daunting, depending on how you learn. So um, this is a great setup for people like me who like to read things, not such a great setup 
for people who learn in other ways, um, except for those tutorials, which may be more useful. But you don't have to be an expert in every, everything about the legislative process or about the legislature. You need to be an expert in your relationship with the legislators that you need, either because you live in their district or they are on committees that handle the issues that you are most concerned with. And so you, you start narrowing your targets so that you have time and energy to really focus on building relationships. And if you wanna bring up the next slide, please. It's gonna say, why bother? So sometimes it feels like this, especially if you've been doing advocacy for any period of time and you don't get the results you want when the first time through. And it's like, why bother? Why am I bothering? I don't have any money. I don't represent anybody who has any power. I'm talking about people that nobody cares about or if they care, they'd like them just to get out of their way, out of their sight, go somewhere else. So why bother? Well, one day it dawned on me early on that these were actually, this was, you know, our legislature. These were our buildings. These, our laws were created here and that these people work for us. So we don't work for them, they work for us. And so the better we are at bringing to the table people who are historically not there, whether it's their class, their color, their disability, their interests, their geography, their age, whatever it is, the better we are not just speaking for, but speaking with and helping them become advocates as well for themselves and for broader issues. And that's probably the biggest change I've seen other than the impact of the internet and social media. Um, it's the deliberate organizing, the reaching out and the organizing of people who never believed that they had a right to engage in this or there was a place for them. And that changes everything. I mean, I, I was on a call with a professor at the University of Washington early this morning about changes that uh, his, his uh, department is doing a study on the Growth Management Act and changes that should be made and recommendations to the legislature. And I, I reviewed the materials he sent and he, he said, oh, look, I want a really open conversation. And I said, well, in your stakeholders, there are a lot of suits, but there's nobody who actually represents the community. I, I don't see any of those folks, those organizations here. I said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I don't even see the landlords. I see, I see the realtors, but I don't see the landlords. Um, so it's the world has changed. Everybody hasn't caught up with the change. And it's our job to keep it changing. So there are 49 districts in Washington state. Unfortunately, they don't have clean geographic lines around them. But on that legislative page, you can pull up a map and you can see the edges of every district. So everybody, Scott, every district has two representatives in the house, seat number one and seat number two, and has a Senator. Now I'm in the 27th. So that's a good chunk of Tacoma. And do you know your, your legislators, your state legislators, everybody? Okay, Roxanne is nodding. I can't see the flowers, um, but it, I, I'm not gonna ask you. But if you don't know, put that on your list of things to do is to make sure that you know them, how to find them, find their websites. Now, this is just a piece off of one of the uh, lists that's on that le legislative information page where they list um, all of the members of the House and then all of the members of the Senate, um, either alphabetically or you can do it by district. And you just get this little brief, you get a picture, 
and then you get the, the uh, links to their homepage, you get the correct spellings of their names, um, the district they represent, you can link to their email, and then details about their office, their district office and their committees. Now, if you wanna live in a district and have somebody really important as your legislator, then pick the 27th right now because Lori Jenkins is the Speaker of the House. And so if you want to know where power sits in the Washington State House of Representatives, it's the woman who is the Speaker of the House, who chairs the Rules Committee, and nothing goes to the floor without it going through the Rules Committee. Now, here's the thing that I think we don't think about a lot. We think in terms often of, um, well, you know, uh, I'm a Democrat and a Democrat did not get elected from my district in this, so I don't have any access. That's not true. Once these folks are elected, they represent everybody in their district, everybody, whether you voted for them or not. And they also represent people who can't vote for whatever reason they can't vote. The governor did an amazing thing out of some of the CARES money, this, the relief fund, the money that has to be spent by the end of December. Over 400 separate organizations and groups and associations and networks and every configuration you can think of came together. And people who were not eligible for employment security those federal checks by virtue of their undocumented status just got $40 million, which is going to go out in cash grants. It's pretty astounding. So, you know, talk about the value of collaborating and the value of having elected officials who listen. Um, so here's Lori. Um, and then let's go on to my next one, Jake. So, the, oops, well, this is what happens when you convert from something you've done on a Mac to something that the rest of the world can do. But basically it's the same layout as Lori's and that's Jake Fye. Um, and after stumbling around his name for years, he finally said, just think of Pi. So now I get it right. So if you notice though, He's chairing transportation, and that's a big deal. Transportation has a separate budget. That's really important. He's also on environment and energy, which makes a lot of sense because for a number of years, he was the head of Washington State University's um, extent energy extension office, although it has a better name than that. But here's the thing you might not know about Jake, and it's true of all legislators. They've got a personal story. So when Jake came to the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness, um, what he talked about was growing up in, South, in uh, Port Angeles as a young boy whose father died and whose mother had not worked and was not able to work. And so they lived on the father's social security benefit. And on the fact that the people in Port Angeles who knew them sort of surrounded them and made sure that they had a good life, made sure that Jake had opportunities. And he went on to college, he graduated from college and he's made youth homelessness his special personal passionate interest. There's now an office of youth homelessness within the Department of Commerce. There's special funding that goes to that office. There's a priority on the homelessness of youth. And Jake Fye and his growing up have a lot to do with that happening. So um, always listen to the backstories um, that people share. Okay, so let's go on to Jeannie. So you get one Senator per district and um, Jeannie Darnielle holds an incredible amount of power in the Senate by virtue of her time in the legislature, first as a representative and then moving into the Senate. Um, and so she's chairing human services, reentry and rehabilitation. Now, you never know exactly what the committees are gonna be when the session starts because 
that's decided at the beginning of the session. So you'll see things renamed. There might be a legislator who has a passionate interest in say housing and all of a sudden there's a standalone housing committee. And then the next session it might go away and it's in, incorporated into something else. So just because you knew how it was last year doesn't mean you know how it's gonna be this year. And then people shuffle their roles as well to make room for others to respond to particular interests or needs that are coming forth in their community or places where they're asked to, to serve and, and use their expertise. So um, when I met Jeannie, who's my friend, um, she was Senator Lorraine Wojohn's legislative assistant. That was about 1984. Now she's the Senator. She's my state Senator. And sometimes when you're advocating, everything will be in terms of, well, if you don't see the elected official, if you don't see the, you know, your Senator, if you don't see the, the committee chair, if you don't see your representative, then somehow your power is diminished or your, your time is not as valuable. Well, I'm here to tell you it's valuable because when I met her, she was a staffer for Lorraine Wojohn. And so the relationships that you build, and that's what you're doing as an advocate, you're building relationships and you're going to change and the other person is gonna to change too. And so the person who is a staffer now may in fact be an elected official later or may become Lisa Brown is now the head of the Department of Commerce. That's an incredibly influential position for anybody who's working in housing, homelessness, any kind of human services, anything to do with basic needs. So it's, um, it's all about relationships. So you want to take another one? Let's go to the next one. So making more new friends. All right, so now you don't have to answer, but here's your, your list. So, you know, have you actually contacted your legislators? So if it was pre-COVID, if it were pre-COVID, um, in person, did you go to their, their local office? Did you invite them to an event? Um, did you go to their office in Olympia? Uh, do you have their email, text, if they text, phone? Um, are their phone numbers in your phone? So just those basic contacts. Have you ever attended a legislative committee? So we can't go in person, but they're re most of them are recorded on TBW and they're archived. Um, the thing about them is, uh, and you can actually sign up for committees and you'll get this notice about a committee meeting and it'll link you to an agenda and to documents. And nobody has time to attend all the meetings that they would like to, which is why we hire people who are policy people or, or government relations people or lobbyists to act for us. Um, but oftentimes I find that in those meeting documents, I see things that I would not have had access to otherwise. They're public documents. It's just that we're not always in that stream of how public becomes public. And we don't know what to ask for. And I've found oftentimes that comments are made by different elected officials or sometimes by the presenters that I wanna follow up on because I think there's been a misunderstanding or because I think that somebody maybe would go farther even than this particular piece of legislation is requesting. Um, and then to, so not just to make a note of it, but to actually follow up, or if you have a lobbyist or if you have somebody who's charged with policy to actually have them follow up. Have you ever testified before the legislature? submitted comments on a bill? Do you track legislation? Are you part of a group that tracks legislation? I'm gonna guess that at least some of you, um, I don't know if Safe Streets itself has a lobbyist, but I'm gonna guess that you are part of some sort of a regional or statewide organization. Um, and testifying before the legislature is gonna be real different um, because it's all gonna be virtual. I think they were trying out some virtual with the Eastern Washington people so that they didn't have to worry about travel and, and weather to be able to participate. But the thing about 
testifying before the legislature is that your wh whomever your guides are, your lobbyists, your policy people, maybe a legislator is asking you to come, they'll give you guidelines. There's a lot of like online training and there'll be a lot of opportunities for webinars and things as we get closer to the session. But the main, there really are a couple of main things that you remember when you're gonna testify. You honor the time that the chair gives you. So you might be invited to make a five minute presentation, but maybe they find out that they've got 50 people who have come to make presentations. And so all of this, your nice five minute presentation now at the beginning of that session gets one minute. And so you've got to be nimble enough to be able to adapt all that work to one minute. You can submit the five minutes worth, but to be able to adapt to one minute, it's scary the first time you do it just because it's unfamiliar, but it's not impossible. And with practice, you can do it. They need to know your name. My name is Maureen Howard. I live in Tacoma, Washington, or I work with, or I am the whatever. You know, it takes about two lines and maybe a bit of a story. And we're gonna talk about stories, maybe um, very careful about the story, how you present it, if it's yours or somebody else's. And then what are you asking? Are you asking them to support this bill? Are you asking them to um, not support this bill? Are you asking for changes? And so they have staff, the committee has staff, each legislator has staff. So there are lots of ways to get information to them. And they're, they're good about reading what they have and responding. Sometimes you get the form letter back, but you know, such is life. Um, would your legislator know you? If you reached out urgently on something, would your legislator know you? Would your legislator know your organization? Know the town you live or work in? Maybe you're in, you know, because I actually know where the Key Peninsula is and I actually have recreational property on a place you all might not know, which is Heron Island. Um, so would the legislators know Heron Island? They're full-time people living out there right now. So, you know, um, what else? Do you reach out? Does your organization reach out? I mean, I've run into really sophisticated nonprofit organization executive directors who are hosting events. And I've said, well, have you invited? Oh no, we didn't think about them. Well, you, you know, you don't know if they'll come, but you know for sure they won't come if they don't know, if they don't get an invitation. And if they do come, make sure you recognize them as part of the introductory remarks. Just thanks for coming. That, that thank you means more than you or I realize. They're accustomed to people coming to them when we need something from them or we want something. The relationships that we want are more ordinary than that. So that when we need them, they know that we need them and they respond to us. And then, as I said before, get to know the staff. They'll be your best friends. You need a meeting time? Well, the legislator is not gonna keep their own calendar Staff person's gonna do that. So you wanna make good friends with the staff. Okay, let's see, what do we got for the next page? More new friends, allies. Okay, so what local or regional or statewide advocacy organizations do you or your organization belong to? And, Assuming that you do. So these are a few things I learned. Play nice, all right? We just don't get anywhere by going, you know, after the juggler with people and organizations with whom we should be able to find some common ground. Sometimes that's more difficult than others. But if we can do that, we can do things that we never thought were possible. 
And so just the courtesies of the common courtesies, tell the truth. Now you may not be able to tell the whole truth because maybe there are internal discussions that are not yet ready to be presented publicly. The board hasn't signed off on them or they are uh, potentially going to be disruptive to something in the area in which you work. I mean, could be a lot of reasons that you cannot declare everything you know, but what you can, you should because that's what engenders trust. Especially now, it, working in this environment, I mean, even if we had a federal relief package tomorrow, we would still be exhausted trying to figure out what exactly was in it, how it could be used, who needed to make the decisions, how to get it out, how to get the people we were most concerned about position to be able to take advantage of that. And everybody's tired, everybody's scared, everybody's exhausted personally and professionally. And so we just don't, we don't have time to play games with each other. We just have to be as straightforward as we can and move forward. Um, know the rules of the road. I mean, how, how are decisions made? How do people interact? How do you get on the right invitation list? How do you get if if all if the if the group you're trying to work with doesn't use their web page and a lot of groups don't they don't update their websites well I use websites then I discovered that a lot of the organizing I was missing was on social media because people were updating Facebook and they were updating things I didn't even know what they were so you have to find out where people are doing their work if you want to participate with them. And then I think it's really important to give something back for the good of the whole. People like Michael, who have lots of years doing this. And, um, oh, the flower man, I forgot your name. Dennis? Not sure. Darren. Anyway. Darren, Darren. I, my computer glasses came, but the um, optical people sent them back because they said they there was something wrong with them. So I can't actually see as well as I'd like to be able to on this computer. Um, but to give something back, if you have a lot of years experience, I think it's incumbent on us to share that experience back out. Okay, stories. Let's see, um, new, new page, Roxanne. Okay, stories. All right. Everybody's got a story. Who wants to hear my story? Who needs to hear my story? How do I tell my story? And what if it's somebody else's story, all right? Do I tell it in a book? Do I write an article? Do I do a blog? Do I tweet? Do I send a text? Do I um, tell it the way I would tell my best friend? Do I have elevator speech? You know, that kind of one or two minutes that they tell you, you've got to know, you know, when they say, well, what does safe streets do? And you say, bah, 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 and it fits exactly in like one minute or two minutes. Do I tell it in three minutes? How, how do I do this? So let's go to the next page. Next page. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. I didn't become an advocate because it's, I took a policy course. Uh, you can do that now. Um, I took it because I took a job when I was an unemployed single woman in Tacoma with a place that I actually went in to close down called the Martin Luther King Ecumenical Center, which was a community organization that had grown out of the faith community across lines that were really critical at that time. They were um, not just Protestant and Catholic, but black and white um, churches, three churches in the hilltop of T Tacoma. And the first person who came for help was a homeless man who didn't ask for shelter, he asked for a job. So I started using what money I had to employ homeless people um, and to shelter them. And I learned to be an advocate and I learned policy out of this experience that was way beyond any experience that I had ever had. Um, I learned to be able to, to craft it, to challenge it, to fight for it. And these are some of the stories that I told. Some of these stories 
are almost 40 years old. Some of these stories are new. Some of these stories are not from this country, but these stories are pretty universal. She had three children before she was 15. For the past week, she has lived in the park. She said she was hungry. I never knew whether to put my arms around someone, but she turned and sobbed against me. She was pregnant when I gave her a job, gave one to her husband too, gave them my old car. She said she got up in the morning because she knew I needed her at work. 30 years later, she emailed me. Was I the Maureen Howard she had known? If so, she wanted me to know her life was good, and thank you. He's in his 40s. He lives under the 11th Street Bridge. God has told him to live there, and he talks only to God. He pours orange juice on trees so they get their vitamin C. He was a homeless street kid. Now he's a mental health professional. She placed her children in other people's care and cried in the park at 3 a.m. when the police told her to move on. She said the house meant she could safely go to the bathroom. He came out of a government building, recognized me, stopped, and wanted me to know how much the day labor I had provided had meant. He had become a government employee. His seven-year-old voice was excited to tell me that his dad said, they were going to camp for a whole year. So let's break into two groups just randomly. And let's just take like 10 minutes and you together figure out a one minute story. So just, you know, talk to each other um, and, and figure out, take, take like a couple minutes to figure out your story and then try it. We should have just enough time to do that in 10 minutes. And if somebody in there is actually able to keep time so that people know when one minute ends, that's good. And you could just stop at the one minute. It, you know, it's not a pass fail. And then we'll come back and share some of those stories. Okay. So if you can, can you, I hope you can put us in groups randomly. Yes. Yeah, I just created random groups. Uh. Well, you're going to learn. All right. All right. So somebody, can somebody be our timer? Uh, the clock has started. Okay. So take like two minutes and figure out your own one minute story. Can be any story for any advocacy kind of purpose. And if that's too much of a stretch, it can be one story for ah. any purpose. So you got two minutes, figure out one minute what you're going to say. When I became uh, the president of the Khmer community, the Coma, and then I won. The wait, 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 wait. Don't talk now. Okay. But we're all figuring out our stories. Okay. So if you want to talk out loud, mute yourself. If you need okay. to practice the one minute. And Maureen, would you It'll mind be the repeating... longest two minutes of your life? Uh, Maureen, would you mind repeating that instruction because I'm going to type it into the other room too, so they can oh, see what the prompt is. So, so have somebody be a timer. Take two minutes to figure out your one minute story, and then we'll share those one minute stories within the group. And they're each going to get just one minute. And I just asked everybody to mute themselves so that they could talk out loud for a minute. 
with only them hearing their, <laughs> their practice run. A minute's harder than you think. Is everybody ready? No. <laughs> when I started writing this, I was thinking about when I moved here and things that I went through when I moved here. And then I started thinking, no, it needs to be current. And so then I just scratched everything out and I went, I'll just keep thinking. It could be anything. How about other people? Everybody else ready? Got your minute? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. All right, who wants to start? I saw Eric's hand go up. So, okay. and Somebody just just to be clear, this is about what your story is and why. It's your story. Why... It's, it's, your, it's one minute, your story, one minute. Okay. So um, my name is Eric Hasted, and I'm a community mobilizer at Safe Streets, which is a small uh, nonprofit down in Tacoma. And so um, I graduated from college up at Western Washington University, and I majored in psychology and communication studies. And I've always been drawn to kind of understanding more about people and what, um, what connects us and how we interact with each other. And then my first job after college was I worked at a behavioral health clinic um, where I saw everyday folks come in, um, you know, they maybe they had depression, maybe they had um, just a lot of anxiety, maybe they're just going through a rough patch in their life and they just needed some advice. And now that I work at Safe Streets and I work with community members on daily, and I really just see the um, sort of the inequities and the barriers that are in place that prevent people from getting the resources that they need, just has made me realize how important it is to advocate for those who aren't able to advocate for themselves and aren't able to get those services that they need to be successful. All right, thanks. Now, was anybody timing? It felt like more than a minute. Uh, uh, Roxanne, are you timing? Was she it a minute? She says it was over. It was over. It was over. All right, folks, one minute. Let's give it a shot. Who wants to Wait. go next? I can go next, is Mike. Okay. I'm just going to wing it. Uh, so any of the advocacy I've done, um, it's in two separate areas. And so they have different ways of achieving the same thing. Um, back in the late eighties, early nineties, I started out as an advocate for mountain biking trails. Um, and that was less of the suit wearing, speaking in front of, uh, you know, legislators that was more on the ground, going to talk to user groups, talking with the department of natural resources, the forest service. And through that, um, it kind of morphed me into not only going to meetings, but coming out to more of the functions, getting my face out there. Um, I, was, I also spent a lot of time on a large union uh, representing that 
that group. And so that was obviously a different plan of attack. That was in a suit going to the legislators offices, meeting with them on a regular basis, sign waving and all that sort of thing. So two different, two different ways to achieve the same thing. All right. Thank you. Next. And, and you made it. You got the minute. Okay. Who'd like to go next? Or I will call on you. Caitlin. You can do this. I'd like to pass, please, if that's okay. What? I'd like to pass, please. Okay. All right. Thank Garrett, you. how about you? Yeah, I was appointed by the former governor, Christina Gray Gore, and current governor, Jay Hensley, to serve on the Asian Pacific American Affair Commission. So we fighting for the Asian uh, rights and also uh, education, social, and uh, and so many. So I, I've been, I know how important it is to know them. When I was a president of the Khmer Rouge of Tacoma, I want to educate them, but I want them to know me first. So yeah, I have been, I've been in Al in Olympia, every building I know which one for which one. So kind, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I hope everybody wrote down that he's the governor's appointee on that commission. These are important things to know. You have two terms. Okay. Alberto, is that you trying to come forward? Yes, that's me. Okay. okay. Um, access to higher education can make such a difference in the life of just an ordinary person. Um, as the child of Mexican immigrants who never attended higher education, never attended even high school or middle school, um, having equal access to or opportunities to access higher education can make all the difference from one generation to the next, not only from employment, whereas my parents worked uh, difficult, strenuous physical labor jobs, but to where I am now, where I'm working an office job at a nonprofit, um, I think for these reasons, it's important to support higher education and make it accessible. And I'm asking you, I'm urging you to vote on House Bill, vote yes on House Bill 9899. All right, well done. Um, Roxanne. So what I started writing with, and I, we only have 40 seconds left, but what I actually started with was um, when I had packed up four kids and moved up here to Washington State. I ended up getting a job. We moved into Spanaway. So something that really stuck with me and has also stuck with my children. So this is not an elevator speech. I don't know how to work it into an elevator speech is that my son was at Spanaway Elementary and on Christmas Eve, people from that elementary school showed up at my house and brought us clothing, furniture, food, everything for Christmas. And from that day on, we made it our mission to make sure we helped anyone that we could. And our time is up. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Eric, can you make us all come back together? Thanks, everybody. And it might be just a minute. Um, when I close the breakout rooms, it gives the other room 60 seconds. Um, okay. So they, they know to pop over as soon as they can. Okay. You are all great. And Caitlin, it's okay to pass. That's a perfectly acceptable position. Anytime, any place, for any reason. And you never have to say why. Thank you Everybody so much, always Did I, were you, Wanda, were you in our group and I missed you? Oh, good. Okay. No, yeah. I was in, the, I was in the other group. Sorry, okay. we just came. No, no, that's okay. No, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we remember that everybody doesn't have to say everything every time and why they choose not to is not our business. So, which is, you know, hard for those of us who are accustomed to finding out everything about everybody and all the time. So, but it's how we all learn. Oh, I forgot who's on the phone. 
Oh, it's Heidi. It's Heidi. Heidi. Thank you. Thank you. So are we all back now? Uh, it looks like it. And Donna had to leave for a class. Okay, that works. Yeah. Okay, let's just take a couple minutes. What did you learn? Anybody? From the uh, exercise? Well, in our breakout group, we uh, were discussing what would be a story. And at one point, we kind of talked about ourselves personally, but the the story that was forefront in my mind from this morning is the 545 children that the headlines are saying we cannot find their parents to reunite them with after they had been separated from the border. So if you were thinking about a story that could relate locally and maybe bring to our legislators, I've been thinking about the Northwest Detention Center located in Tacoma and maybe some action to connect with people there to see if they have been separated from their children and find a way to start the process to at least fill in the gaps of information that weren't collected at the time of separation. All right. So an actual action came out of the story. Anybody else? I learned that Darren was a governor's governor's appointee on an Asian commission. That's pretty incredible. That's right. These are important things. Was that was it the South Asian Commission? Darren, can you unmute yourself? It it, it is for a state. I I Eric, it's for a state. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Um, the, the commission commission for an, on Asian Pacific American Affair is for the, the state of Washington. Okay. So the so, governor the governor is is uh, my boss. I love it. And and then we have we have all authority to invite all the department in the state of Washington to come to do a presentation if any Asian Pacific Islander need to uh, have a question. For example, Alberto brought up a good point. High education. That's what the Asian Pacific Islander concentrate on and economy and 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 um, health care, uh, home care program. All right. Anybody else? Let's take one more. I found it difficult to squeeze um, everything that I wanted to say into one minute or to condense it enough. I'm glad that you said that because I think that's the hardest part when you start trying to do this because you have so much you wanna say and you think the world needs to know all of it. And my experience is you need to get it out and then you set it aside and you go back to, I have one minute for this group. What is it I want them to remember? And you'll have another chance to tell it all or you'll create that chance. But yeah, it's, it's hard. So practice, I'm serious. I've been talking for years and years. I've given you know, national keynotes and I practice first. A colleague of mine from when I was at the, I did my uh, graduate work in theology at the University of Notre Dame. And one of my colleagues was out of Boston and he had actually uh, gone to school with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, you could hear him practicing those sermons. Yeah. You could hear him all night long practicing. Now, when he got up to talk, you thought it just sort of came. No, he practiced and he practiced and he practiced. So, yeah. I think okay. Miriam, Miriam Alberto question is really happening. It's still going on. For example, you need to, the committee, the group need to come out. We have four or five agenda. So which one is the first priority in the short term that need to, you need to share with them? That's right, exactly. That it just, in this session, what we're told so far is um, that, uh, so I work on the housing and homelessness side with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. And what we are being told right now is that the legislators are saying, 
pick two bills because they're gonna limit the number of bills in all probability that they're gonna be able to work on in this virtual session. So pick your top two. So yeah. Okay, I wanna quickly do a couple of other things. Um, I'm going, this is probably not so important for you from the faces that I can see and the stories that you've told so far. But for those of you who are like me, white, then my charge to you is that in every meeting, in every room, and maybe it applies to everybody, but I have a friend who's, a, she was a, a foreign service officer with me in South Africa, and she's an African-American woman. And she says, Maureen, your job is to talk to white people. And so I do this thing I call Maureen's Musings. And in, in that, I try and remember to talk to white people. But if the room does, or the meeting does not reflect your community, the people you represent or with whom you work, then the days are gone when we can say, well, we don't know anyone. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do for the past few years is to go looking, to find people who don't look like me, who don't have my experiences, and to invite them into these rooms. And now I've got some other white people who are saying, well, yeah, like Maureen says, we got to look around and see who's here. <laughs> and it's more difficult to look around virtually if people are on the phone and you don't know them. But we have got to work at this. Safe Streets is more fortunate. Those of you who have identified yourselves as staff um, because you are more reflective of the communities that I recognize ac across the county. But every organization is not that fortunate. So I think we have to take it seriously. If we are white, those of us who are white, we have to listen. We just have to shut up and listen. And this is not the time when we say, well, you know, my ancestors didn't, were not slaveholders and all kinds of other incredible things people say. It's the time when we listen and hopefully we learn. And I, I want to take a couple of our minutes. I want to read you something I wrote after George Floyd was murdered and Roxanne has seen this, but I don't think anybody else has. So this is what I wrote um, and sent out. I've got about 140 people on this list. If I knew how to do a blog, it'd be a blog, but it's an email. A few words to the white people on this list. What we cannot do, we cannot hide in our race and equity trainings and our diversity committees. We cannot be silent. We cannot be smug. We cannot return to a place that never was. Will the violence spread? I don't know. Is violence inevitable? I don't know. Will Trump call out the army on us? It's possible. Is property more important than human life? It seems so. What can we do? We can do what our sisters and brothers from communities of color have done all their lives. We can stand together through the pain. We can sing through the sorrow. We can learn to change the structures that maintain and exacerbate white wealth and privilege. We can be grateful that our friends of color continue to welcome us into their lives. As long as we draw breath, we can get up every morning and work to make this country we call home a place of peace, a place of justice. And maybe, just maybe, we can learn to love each other. So find what grounds you. And if you can find, I think it's page 18, Roxanne, and we'll look at the future and just do a little bit of Q&A. And so while this is coming up, Michael, you probably are in a, an equivalent place. Yeah, you can just keep going one more. So what I didn't realize when I started as an advocate is 
I didn't know how long this was going to take. I really didn't have a sense of it. And that was something that people from whom I learned didn't talk about. So I think it's important to talk about it. So the first thing is to plan to be around. Um, I was on a, in a group of women who uh, were privileged to report on the, uh, to go to Ireland and meet with Irish women and report on the uh, status of women in Ireland. It was the first, you know, kind of um, analysis. And my roommate was a Navy Lieutenant Commander, Evelyn Lewis, um, she, a Navy doctor. And, you know, she wore her Navy official uniform all the time and she looked pretty sharp and um, with, you know, the various ribbons and all that sort of thing until she came to give her presentation to this whole group. And we're in this big arena and I don't know how many hundred people were there. And I always, I got the poverty section, you know, sort of, I guess that's why they invited me. But anyway, so anyway, here's Evelyn. And I'm like, but where's Evelyn? I'm looking around, I can't find Evelyn. All of a sudden it's time for, they introduce her and she comes running down the middle aisle in sweats. And she stands up and she starts doing these little finger exercise things. You know what she talks about? She talks about if you want to be here to make change happen, then you better take care of yourself and you better start exercising and eating and all of those sorts of things. I can't tell you what anybody talked about that whole week, traveling around Ireland, meeting different people in different places. But I can tell you about Evelyn running down that aisle in her sweats and starting to do finger exercises with us. So we'd be here to keep the work going. So that's the first thing I tell you is take care of yourself. Find your place. We don't always land in the right place first. Sometimes you have to move to a different place. That's not bad. We're just learning. And so we just, you know, keep searching until we find the right place. Sometimes it doesn't last forever and you move on and do something else for a while and then you come back knowing more than you did before. Um, stand in a circle of good friends and really work on those friendships. If somebody loves you, if you have a partner, then take care of that partnership and hold it. Um, don't let your partner, your children, your family be the last on the list. Although right now, I got to tell you, my husband, when I say I have to, we've been together almost 40 years. And he, when I say, I've got meetings, I've got to go to my study. And he goes, well, I'll see you tomorrow, which sometimes feels like that. But he knows that this period isn't going to last forever. Create a network of colleagues who will challenge you, support you, respect you, and extend their networks to you. This is one of the most amazing things I've experienced in nonprofit work, the sharing that goes on. Somebody says, oh, you should talk to so-and-so here. Let me make the introduction. Or you should talk. I got an enormous amount of public recognition, opportunities to speak that I never would have had working in the health op in Tacoma in the 80s on all kinds of platforms, all sorts of places, because a woman who was a peer who was working in Seattle, a woman named Martha Diltz, who recognized that she was really good, but she worked within the box. And she recognized that I worked outside of the box. And so when people wanted to someone who was creative, who would challenge the status quo, she'd say, get Maureen, she'll do that. And so her generosity enhanced my work my life. Um, and yeah, we're still in touch. Do something that's really selfish because it really isn't selfish and figure out what that is. So I'm a singer. I sing. I read. You know, Mother Jones, sit down and read. Prepare for the revolution. It's not quite right, but it's pretty close. Garden. I discovered this summer that if you water the sweet peas, that they'll bloom a lot better. Laugh. If I find that I'm not laughing, then something's wrong in my life. The ancestors, they're important to me. 
I think I do genealogy in part because my father did, in part because I want to understand these people and what made them do the things they did. And frankly, one of the nice things about genealogy, in, in my life, I have experienced a tremendous amount of personal pain and violence. So I had nine brothers and sisters. And in October of 1970, Mark was killed in Vietnam. In the summer of 1979, a month before her wedding date, we had to decide as a family to disconnect life support on Jean. There was, uh, she was an epileptic and it, we think she probably had a seizure while she was um, intertubing on the Green River. And in the summer of 1981, about a week after his high school graduation, I got a call from my one of my brothers who said, the hospital just called. We think they think it's Jim. You go to the hospital and identify him and I'll go tell the folks. And when I got to the hospital, it was Tony who had just graduated from high school. And so there were three brothers, two brothers and a sister when we buried. And on Tony, we had to do the same thing as a family decide that we would have to disconnect the life support system. So that coupled with surviving rape at the, by more than one man, gunpoint and knife point, um, and then just the ordinariness of life left me in a position where if, you, if I do genealogy, everybody's already dead, all right? And so it's a lot less painful and you can sort of enter into their lives and, and see what happened. And then I saved a couple of hundred at least of these public talks I gave from 1982 on. And some of them have made their way into a draft of a book that I call Stories Out of Season. And if the world around me would ever calm down, it would get from draft to final. But it's been sitting now for several months, just sort of marinating. Give back. If you can volunteer with the skills that you have from your profession or from other parts of your life, and you're in a position to be able to do that, give back. It's especially as you, you who, so I just turned 76 this summer. So it's like everybody's young to me, but we are aging out at an incredible rate across this country. And people are taking unbelievable skills with them as they leave the work, the formal workplace. So figure out if you're one of those people, how you can give back. If you are one of those people who are still in the workplace, Look around and figure out how you can make welcome someone who brings with them knowledge that you may not have, experience that you haven't had the opportunity to engage in, um, and see how they fit. Uh, I told you about Maureen's musings. If you want to uh, be on the list, uh, let me know. We're going to save the chat. And don't go it alone, all right? Don't be afraid to be critiqued. Um, that's one of the things, we do a terrible thing to our leaders and we sort of say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful. Well, we're not, we're human beings. We screw up as much as anybody else. Uh, we usually do it more publicly. Um, and so we need people who will help us, who will make that community of love around us. And with that, I'm going to say, like with Angela Davis, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. So if you have not done so, if you don't see yourself as an advocate at the state level, I want you to walk away tonight believing you can do that. I want you to, if you already are in that position, I want you to hone your skills and get ready for the session. And in either case, I want you to make a plan. Um, it doesn't have to even be on paper. It can be on your phone. It can be in three bullets, whatever it is. But I want you to make a plan and I want you to hold yourself accountable to that plan. 
Um, and I want to thank you for um, this, you know, evening. This is great. We've got a few minutes left. So if you want to chime in with a question or a comment or whatever, now's your chance. Uh, to me, it's just like refreshing the course, but I just want to add on something like Marin talk about, get to know them. And uh, if you do something in the district that re improve or uh, with the social issue or uh, economy, please inform them, email them, just ask why I, they, they do the report, say, yeah, the legislature, they do the report just like, hey, we have something going on in the neighborhood, get to know them especially especially the, the staff of legislature, they are a main important person to get along. Just write that on the wall. Keep, keep reading that. Yeah. They're in, absolutely correct. And invite them to come to event, even though they come or not, but ask if, if, if they know if we are having a hosting the event. They appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, just in talking about knowing your elected legislators, I know the two that are there currently, hope they'll be gone soon. Joyce Stanford <laughs> is one of the other two. Emily Randall is um, the other person that, of course, Derek and Derek. Um, so yeah, knowing all of them is very important. And so that brings up a really important piece, I think. One is um, if the incumbents leave and they have done anything that you can support, then, or maybe everything you can support, um, let them know that. If whomever comes in, if new people come in, then figure out how to make friends, make new friends. And just, you, you know, you think I'm too busy, I can't do this. But you can. You can send that, you know, welcome to the, you know, rep, you know, if you're not glad, you don't have to say you're glad that they're representing you. But, you know, we look forward to working with you and your new position. And, and we know that you will represent all of us. And we'd like to brief you on what we're doing on the Key Peninsula, you know, that sort of thing. You can always find the words. Right. So, yeah, there's part of your plan. So I'm obviously, so glad you're here. <laughs> Somebody uh, else. So obviously you're very experienced and you have a pretty large network that I'm sure that you keep keep up with, but um, how often do you tend to send emails to your representatives or how often would you recommend for someone who's kind of just starting out to build, try to build some relationships? I wouldn't send them for no reason. Mm -hmm. I would uh, send them. Um, so I would, I would rely on my organization. If, if the organization doesn't have a plan yet, I'd ask the organization to get a plan together. How, what's our plan for this session? And maybe the organization doesn't have a plan. Maybe the plan is that you belong to a, a larger group and follow their plan. So I, because I know these folks, I generally, these three, I generally um, reach out when it's personally, when it's something that I want to make sure they know. Um, but a lot of times uh, I'll use the uh, big red button that the Low Income Housing Alliance provides. And some, if I'm busy, I'll just send the letter that they've scripted. And if I have time, I'll adjust it. But um, I think that, you know, you just use some, ask them. When you meet with them, ask them, how often would you like me to update you? Now, when it sometimes you think, 
Okay, Michelle Thomas, who's just a superb um, policy advocate for the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, did a training yesterday for members of the Alliance and anybody else. And she said, look, just because you know this legislator supports is in alignment with what you're asking, don't stop reaching out because what happens is that there'll be hundreds of people in the opposition reaching out. And you want your legislator in a position to say, I've got twice as many requests from, or letters of support or emails or sign-ons or you know whatever um, from people who support this as people who are opposed. So you wanna have their back basically. So yeah. Great, and thank also, you. And also Miriam, uh, what Eric brought up is a good point and you need to know uh, which legislature responsible of, for what project, of uh, what uh, 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 activity. That's and really you, important too. And you find that as soon as they make assignments, that'll be public information and all that information is going to be on that legislative site. You may get it through your broader network, but you'll for sure get it on the legislative information page there. So, yeah. Other thoughts? Well, that being the case, we can I end- Marian, I have uh, just like, be truthful to them, be truthful to them. Be truthful. You have to be honest and active, engage with them. Otherwise, they don't like the flip-flop. They don't want to work with the flip-flop people. You have to be truthful with them and the project. That's true. Now, we've talked about the state legislature. You can do the same thing with the folks in Congress. It's really easy. You know, you put the phone numbers in your, I always put the Washington office, DC office in, and it's really easy to have coffee with Congress. You know, get up, they're three hours ahead of us. So get up and punch that button and, and, Sometimes I'll just call in the night because I know it's on the answering machine. Sometimes it, it, these have been, you know, hard years. And it's, so I'll just call and say, thank you. You know, thanks for hanging in there. And, you know, thanks for trying, you know, thanks for representing us. Um, and uh, Caitlin, I know, mentioned earlier that she'd actually um, testified before the, I think, the county council. Excellent. The, the beauty is that we're still in such a small um, area population wise that our councils, county, city councils are incredibly accessible to us. And so, you know, look at that. We could do a, a whole thing on that as well. Um, anyway, folks, thank you. It's been a very real pleasure for me and um, Thanks for your work and uh, yeah, do those exercises, you know. And thank you, Maria. Maria. Thank and you, and Maria. also say hello to Ginny Daniel. Indeed. Yeah, she's a, my really good best friend. Good. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah. My pleasure.